co-production has been a part of Watts Gallery for over the last 100 years. It is not a new thing to us. Mary Watts um, was uh, one of our founders, uh, was working in co-production with the local community to um, establish the Compton Potters Art Guild, uh, where she taught locals how to work with clay and that developed onto even make the Watts Chapel. Um, and so on the Art for All Community Learning Programme, this way of working has come from strength to strength, particularly over the last year during the pandemic, where we were having to bring our communities together um, under really difficult circumstances. Um, and we've been working with several artists across the year to do just this. And I'm with um, Becky Kennings here, to, um, to consider the, um, the ways that we have worked together on a project called Flock Together. Um, we were looking to, we've been in partnership with the Park Barn Community Centre, which is now called The Hive um, in Guildford to, um, we were offering weekly workshops there and during the workshop, at the pandemic, we had to completely alter how we were working um, while all the participants were safe at home. Um, and so, uh, Becky, thank you for joining me. Um, and I would like to start by asking you very simply, how did you, how did you work in partnership with the community? In this particular project, um, our focus was making something that um, was quite straightforward to follow. Um, we had a relationship with people within the community uh, via the original workshops. And from that, Ellen and I knew we were very quite clear that often the facil facilitation and encouragement was, was really key. Our presence was really key to make a creative uh, interaction happen. So the challenge was to do that remotely. So our invite was um, very carefully put together um, to ask people to do something quite straightforward, really. Uh, we wanted them to draw something and uh, to draw something that was so straightforward and so simple with very, very simple resources. It actually meant from our point of view, in a co-authored way, we could pull them together and create something as a community quite easily. So, um, that's where the colouring book came from. Um, we decided that using something simple as um, a felt tip or even a strong pencil and some decent uh, drawing paper, a very simple pack like that being shared out was really quite straightforward. Um, obviously we did it um, with a bit of creative flair. There was also um, some bird seed in there because we'd focused on birds as our um, theme. Um, we decided to invite them to make recycled bird feeders and so forth. Um, it, it wasn't just a, a flat invite of can you draw a bird? Um, and I think it had a bit of humour to it and we invited people to be a bit crazy. They could just say, oh, I don't want to draw Robin. I want to create a parrot that only lives on a desert island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Whatever they wanted it, it was fine. So um, it, was, it was playful, it was straightforward. Um, we weren't asking too much from a community that we knew um, often um, struggled getting access to, you know, to creative items and stuff. So um, we made it really straightforward and that was the key, I think, to the success. Yeah. Yeah, I think it really is a product of the time. Um, and I think normally I think I'm quite controlling over wanting everything we do to really be uh, coming from our collection. Yeah. But I think this link with our collection was George and Mary featured birds in their work. Exactly. What are you going to do? And it felt like the wrong time to push it any further than that, to be yeah. honest. And I think, I think actually when we designed the um, invite, which frankly was a page of A4, wasn't it? Um, there was not, it wasn't heavy with um, lots of fine art pictures or anything like that. Um, because I think both of us have decided that that may not land without our introduction in person. And therefore we went for that very straightforward line drawn um, sketches of birds and sketches of how to make the feeder. And it actually felt very welcoming, it was welcoming because it was, um, it was quite naive really, the way it was put together. Um, and I think that it wasn't intimidating. Anyone could have picked up a felt tip pen and, and felt that they could totally 
get involved with that project. Yeah, yeah. I, I like what you, you say about um, the, the aspect of us not being there, how often a good workshop starts with a chat and a cup of tea, which is so Absolutely. powerful. And it, it feels quite jarring to me that when we're having these interactions with people and not doing that. Yeah, I think, um, and certainly this wasn't just a one-off, was it? This has been happening across the board with all sorts of organizations, certainly artists and, and community artists whose frankly their bread and butter is meeting people. Um, and I know certainly from my own work, they are my, as it were, resource, they're my inspiration. And it's the person who's standing or sitting or, you know, sitting on the rug with me when we're discussing stuff or over a cup of tea or playing with some art materials. They're the people who inspire the work. So when you're having to do that without them actually being there, I think it pushed us as creatives to, to really um, drill down what was necessary to make sure that it happened. No clutter no extra bits be really clear what you needed a real clear plan really straightforward and and i think one thing we both realized very quickly was to use the network that was already within that community to find the people who needed this project mm, mm. yeah yeah good point um yeah we didn't have to build that that was in place yeah yeah, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We went with people who knew the people we needed to um, engage with, but also knew who would benefit from doing it. So um, as it were, our seeds landed on, you know, fertile soil and we ended up with um, the drawings and, and the input coming back to the park barn with a sense of pride, you know, that they had been involved with it. Um, and then of course that sequence of then us picking it up from them. I think that procrastination um, in the sense that normally if you and I are doing a workshop we, we sort of turn up and for two hours it can be bonkers, frantic, all sorts is going on but at the end of the two hours you know where you stand, you know what you've got, you know who's turned up, you know what you've created but with this particular project because of that time stretch that procrastination of waiting Ooh, are they going to respond what we're we going to get you know it didn't come in one chunk there was a series of uh, drops that happened um that was an, a bit of an eye opener as quite an impatient artist i think um th that was necessary it was absolutely key for the success of it yeah good point good point and Becky, my next question is perhaps strange for you because I know that this um, way of working with communities is not new to you, but through this process, through co-production, what have you learned about your practice? I think certainly from the fact that, you know, I've been working in sort of co-authored and co-produced work for, I'd say, over 10 years, 12 years. Um, I think in a reflective way when I'm looking at this specific time working um, remotely is I actually have evaluated that my skill set of working with people um, is is to be valued and not to take it for granted and and I, I feel even more passionately about the need for it so um, by having in a sense some element of how I normally work pulled away it made me realize how much I need it and for a creative point of view but from a personal point of view it's the way I work you know it's the way I tick in terms of this project it did fulfill that because when the drawings came back some of them had little notes on them or something and I actually it would bring a smile I was like oh, I could almost imagine this person who's driven you know written this together who's drawn this bird and I actually really enjoyed playing with putting the birds together and seeing what relationships those birds might have with each other. And um, I know that once we had the book printed, I was so excited to get it back to them. That was that was a really important thing to me. So that anything co-authored, anything, it needs to be shared in a really professional way and a respectful way back to those who've invested time and their and their own creative endeavor so that was a really important part of this 
Mm -hmm. I think that's um, that's perhaps a bit of a theme that comes across with these Q and A's I'm doing with artists. Mm -hmm. um, that there is there must be respect for yes. the, the work that you're receiving and the makers of that work too. Yeah, and and the need to uh, there's always a balance to curate what you've got coming in because um, that's your responsibility certainly. Um, but um, that respect of who's brought what to the table and how you make sure that they're seen within the project so that when it's shared back, when they pick it up, they can see themselves there. They can see their work there and they will want to keep it. They will want to share it with you know, friends and family. Um, and I know that from hearing back from you that people were asking for more than one copy of the book and so forth, that, that's the proof of the pudding, isn't it? Um, that's the pride. And if you've managed to, to to keep that level going, um, yeah, I think that that's really important. Yeah, yeah, good point. Yeah, my next question is, I and I think you have touched on this a little mm -hmm. bit, is about the the challenges that you um you came up against in this project. Yeah. You touched on the the fact that there is that nerve wracking weight of receiving post back with the drawings. Is there anything else? Um. Maybe that sense that because I, I, I don't work on my own, I'm normally with people um, all the time. I think that when I eventually put the design together, um, I was very grateful to be able to share it with you so that I did have another voice, another eye on it. Whereas normally you're doing it with people. You have that as a constant, well, a vibe that you know that they are in with what you're making they're kind of going yeah I like what you're doing let's continue doing it you know um, it's a conversation it's a collaboration whereas when it all came to me and I was sorting it out and I put it together there was that absence of the community's voice right there next to me yeah. saying oh that bird needs to be here or that you know or can't my mate be next to me you know you get all those comments you know that if you're doing murals or something like that somebody goes oh can't my work be next to so-and-so's work or whatever um so I think that silence was interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, again, made me extremely grateful for when I don't have that silence. Um, but having that small community of you and I and, and um, the printers and so forth, that and the design team at Watts being having that eye over the whole thing, it, it, it did sort of compensate. Yeah, yeah good point, yeah. Um, and my next question is, I, I think really, really, um, I want to hear your ideas on this. What tips do you have for other artists who are working um, with groups to co-produce? So I think I have touched on some of the things already when I've been speaking. And I know that from the other artists that you've been speaking to, this is coming up. But it's that um, need to respect the individuals that are stepping up to co-author or co-produce with you. And a community can be three individuals or it can be 300 individuals, but the, the really key part of this is that you, you remain committed to that ethic of co-author and co-production all the way through the planning, but also all the way through the project. Sometimes you can lose your way and start, especially if you're, you know, an experienced artist who creates your own work, you can go off on a tangent. And actually, it's really important to make whoever it is that's working with you are front and centre, right all the way through, through all your decisions. And if that means you have to pause, if that means you have to reflect um, with them or on your own, or whether you have to... Um, add another stage in, you need to nudge people, you need to go and get some advice or whatever. That's important not to assume that you just stick with the plan that you had from the beginning. Mm -hmm. If for whatever reason, that's not being truthful, that's not being respectful or it's not being authentic to the people that you're working with. That's really, really key. Um, I, when I started out doing co-authored work, one thing, I didn't actually have that phrase. And it was so difficult to, un to get people to understand what I did. And one of the phrases I used was that if I made a piece with people, I wanted them to be able to walk up to whatever that was and see their fingerprints all over it. And that 
is the best way I could explain before I had the right terminology of how I worked and how my practice was developing is that it, that was a really important part to me, um, the full circle. So working with them, wonderful, creating the work, wonderful, but the cherry on the top was witnessing them see the finished article or piece or product or process or whatever we'd done and then see the pride in them and sense of achievement, sense, sense of self-esteem. That was the key to why I work co-authored and co-produced work. So I would say, yeah, make sure people's fingerprints are really, really, really clear in whatever you produce. Great, thank you. I, I, um, I think that's one of the strengths of your practice and that's really <laughs> evident. And I think it's very clear in, uh, in the outcome of Flock Together. Too. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, um, Becky, I was going to ask you about uh, the the way that you took inspiration from the collection, but I think we've touched on that, actually. How was yeah, I think it was a kind of a, I'm not sure what came first, chicken and the egg, but um, it needed to be a subject that anybody could look out of their window and see. And I think, actually, it's the same ethic of how Watts used to paint and certainly Mary took her um, localized inspiration. Anything, when you walk around the gallery, when you walk around the chapel and when you um, walk around their own house, there is nature absolutely everywhere. Mm. And um, I think it, by definition, we were authentic to the way Mary or George would have responded, you know, because they would have said, well, what's outside your, you know, what's out your kitchen window? what's outside your bedroom window you know um and I think because of that the birds seemed an incredibly straightforward but quite imaginative way about going things um we have a great amount of birds that we see luckily we all live you know in Surrey which is is you know very good for that um but actually we allowed that freedom for people to just use their imaginations and um uh, it was easy to do and the, and the results in the book you can see how easy it was for people to go actually his big you know his beak's got to be massive or his eyes are different sizes or there's a feather sticking out of his arm or something like that um, so yes there was a lot of humour in what came back um, and considering what we were all going through then with the lockdown I think uh, it did show some good spirit there yeah yeah Becky, I, I think everything you're saying is, is stuff that Mary Watts would be approving of. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for being part of uh, part of the community programme. Um, oh, it's always really a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.